think is big data and business intelligence. For that, I would like to invite Mr. Nitin Verma, big data scientist, a huge round of applause to have our session on big data and business intelligence. Very good morning to all of you. My name is Nitin Verma. I am a doctorate from IIM Ranchi and I am also an engineer and an MBA. I happen to be across marketing information systems and I have also been in manufacturing uh, for uh, high-end projects, construction, um, you know, boilers, reactors, nuclear reactors. So I have been through quite a bit of spectrum of uh, industry. Today we'll talk about big data and analytics and we will also contemplate whether this is for everybody. And when I mean everybody, we will also talk about whether this is for the smaller enterprises. Because we have most of the case studies we have so far, these case studies are for larger enterprises or for Fortune 500s. So this is the structure of the presentation. We will briefly look at what is giving rise to this tsunami of big data. Uh, we will define big data a little formally so that we will all have a common way to define it. And I'll talk about it, why that is necessary. Uh, then we'll talk about what happens every day um, and how big data is becoming even bigger data. Uh, we will look at the new business environment because of which you are all here. Um, you know, it is important to understand why we are talking about this now. Um, and is there a future without big data? We will uh, then look at a proper explanation for what is analytics and you know, what is in it for you um, if you want to acquire these skills, if you want to get into this area. We will look at the analytics pie. We will look at some areas and leaders in this. Uh, we will then look at the challenges and learnings from around the world and then hopefully we will have the answer to this question, is big data for all, small and big. So welcome to this presentation. Data volumes are exploding actually. If you look at uh, you know, how much data humans had historically, um, in, the, in the last two years only, we have actually created far more data than we ever had all books, texts combined, everything put together. We have actually surpassed that in just last two years. Uh, does anybody think this is going to stop here? No, because what we have done in the last two years, I think is soon going to happen in just one year. And then there are predictions that this will happen in just one day. So the data is going faster than ever before. And by 2020, we will, all of us, each one of us, we will contribute, like I said, 
something like two megabytes per second of data, each one of us, just because we are on this planet. So that is the kind of forecast. Um, and what is happening to Google, just, just to get an idea, at this point of time, as I speak, about 40,000 queries have happened in just one second, in just one second. So that is about 1.2 trillion queries a year already at this point of time. And we have just started. Um, in 2015, you know, I was amused to find that one, one trillion pictures had been taken, one trillion pictures had been taken by humans, and billions had been shared online. Now, we don't know anything about these pictures. We don't know what was in these pictures. This is an ocean to find out. You know, what are people talking about when they share pictures? Um, and then, by, by 2017, I read somewhere, they said 80% of the pictures are now photos. They are coming from mobiles. So cameras are out, literally, you know. I mean, I, not, I don't mean the, the smartphone camera, but the traditional thing we call the camera is out now. It's, it's almost dead. We, we know about Kodak, what happened to Kodak, right? Kodak was the company that used to make the films, and we know where it is now. I mean, it is literally. Um, so by 2020, we will have almost, almost uh, one smartphone for you know, just, just about every human, just by 2020. And how far is 2020, by the way? Does it look very far when, I, when, you know, when, when we talk about 2020, 25? How does it feel like? I mean, does it feel like, uh, oh, it's so far away, 2020. We are talking about the future. Is it really future? This is 2018, right? So 2020 is just one, one and a half, two years, maybe, yeah? And then, uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, we talk about distributed computing and how, much, how many of us really know what is distributed computing, for example. But are you using it? Yes, you are. Every Google query at this moment, it is touching 1,000 computers. And that query completes in 0.2 seconds, less than 0.2 seconds. So we are, we, are, we, are, we are working with systems that we don't see anymore. We can only touch them through the touch screen, and that's all there is to it. So this is a huge thing uh, where things have been made easy for us by mega, mega enterprises through investments in technology. And what about the White House? I, I talk about you know, the US government uh, having lived there for a long time. I worked on some projects with the federal government there. They have serious investments, serious investments, you know, when, when you talk about it. Uh, anybody heard about Project Prism? Anybody? No? Okay, please Google it if, if you, you know, if you want to find out. So what was Project Prism? You know, it was kind of a surveillance program through Facebook and Microsoft and everybody else, which the FBI, the CIA, you know, they created. But I mean, you know, so casting that aside, I mean, these companies came out clean. Facebook said, no, we don't, you know, we, we're not helping the CIA and so on and so forth. But there, there is a formal program to collect all the data, every single piece of data that you and I create sitting here in India is being watched by somebody. So that is the kind of investment the US government is making. Now why do you think, are they crazy that they are looking at your pictures and my movies and you know stuff like that? In 2015, yeah, because I, I did some research on uh, internet security. In 2015, the White House declared who as a terrorist of the year. Who was the terrorist? Was it Bin Laden or somebody else? No. They declared cyber terrorism is the number one threat to the United States. And that threat, they say, is far bigger than any man-made threat. So this is 2015. It's already happened, um, you know, and cyber security is such a big thing now. And uh, what, what about the cloud? You know, we are all floating in clouds. You know, we are all happy angels now. We are floating in the clouds, you know, contributing data, making connections, networking, right? So. It, it seems new. I mean, it, it looks like, hey, this cloud just happened, right? I mean, does anybody remember, you know, hearing about this thing called cloud a couple of years back? I don't. I don't know, right? So, but, but in just two years, one third of all our data will actually reside in clouds. 
So why am I talking about this? This is the pace of technology. This is the pace of big data. It's coming at us. We don't even know the terms yet. Uh, you know, if, if I was to have a poll in India and, you know, across the nation, um, you know, and if, if, if I was to ask, hey, how many of you have actually heard about the term called cloud computing? So you know the answer, right? But just imagine that in two years, people won't even know and they will be floating in the clouds. Um, and I found this to be very interesting, I mean, and scary, both, that by 2025, we will actually be a minority on this planet. Who will be in the majority? It will be the smart connected devices. There will be something like 8.2 billion people, it's, it's a focus, and there will be approximately six times of those machines, you know. So, that being said, you know, because uh, I was coming to this retail conference and I found this to be interesting, so I thought why not talk about, you know, what is uh, in, uh, in this for retailers. A uh, typical study found out that if retailers leverage this opportunity, which is being offered by big data, this can add 60% to their margins, operating margins. And for a Fortune, typical Fortune 1000 organization, just 10% increase in data excess will add typically about $65 million. So this is the financial impact, you know, this is the economic impact of what we're talking about today. Um, and at this moment, how much data do we analyze, by the way? Um, just less than half percent as a humanity. Um, and we know about 100, 100 smart cities coming up in India. Uh, so there, there is just a beginning, you know, there's going to be more smart cities, obviously. Um, US has moved ahead and I will in fact show you uh, some findings from those smart cities as part of this presentation. Um, and there is huge impact, like I said, you know, in terms of healthcare, which is a primary concern. I mean, we want to respect life, that is the prime thing, right? So if you are alive, you are the economy. Um, and there is very, very significant impact to be made there. So this is what is happening per minute. Uh, you know, these are number of, number of transactions, users, participants on different forums, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, with just 3.2 billion people. And uh, this is what is happening in some smart cities. You know, uh, these actually, the cities that I'm showing you here, uh, they are winners uh, of the Smart Cities Award 2017-18 uh, in the US. And they have taken a number of initiatives. Now, why am I talking about smart cities here? What do, what do smart cities have? Can, can please uh, somebody tell me why are we talking about smart cities in, in a big data uh, presentation? It's, it's connectivity, yes. And then uh, these are the devices we were talking about, you know, the, the smart devices. So it's already happening, you know, so Miami has smart buildings that switch off, switch on, determine what, um, you know, air conditioning you need, what is the light, uh, the luminosity you need, you know, so stuff, stuff like that. Um, you even have smart water usage, um, you know, which knows when to turn on, when to turn off, for, for when, where, why. Uh, there is civic engagement, administration has become very smart, you know, they're doing they're trying to train drivers online without doing an actual driving test. So there are games, and this is maybe an idea for um, you know us in India because I was talking to somebody. Uh, I was telling Nayan also, you know, I was talking to somebody in the Ministry of Transport, and I told them, why can't we do this here? We have the power here. We have the manpower. Why do our people, you know, have to, um, you know, have no place to drive, and you know, therefore, no place to learn how to drive? I mean, you can do this. Right? So, so these are very powerful ideas and uh, these are happening. Um, emergency management, you know, dis disaster management. Education we know is a very big use case for big data. Urban planning and land use. Uh, you know, how many of us feel threatened you know, whenever you have to make an investment in any property, right? any assets? I mean, you, you're really scared. I mean, will I have this registry thing? You know, will I have to do this deed? And will it be safe? You know, will it be gone? Will somebody take over my, some, somebody break the door of my flat in, in Pawai and, you know, get into it and what will I do, right? So there are things like that. But you can be smart about it. So this is the time for us, um, you know, uh, to learn. So that's why I put this here. Um, what is uh, tourism, arts? This, this is so much, actually. And of course, we know the police and law enforcement, right? So having said that, um, 
I just want to briefly mention this uh, because again this is a retail conference. Um, this is called the retail apocalypse, right? So apocalypse is nothing but a disaster kind of for the rest of the people in the retail. So Amazon's Prime Day, it actually caused other people uh, to drop, you know, going to the, these stores, all these stores. These are all U.S. stores. This was a data uh, found from a survey. Um, and you can imagine the impact of big data that this will have, you know, because now you have competition coming in. So what is big data? You know, we, we've talked about big data, big data. So this is the, I would say, the official definition of big data. Big data is defined uh, in terms of volume, velocity, and variety. So this was the original concept of big data, that if you have a lot of volume, you know, volume in terms of megabytes, gigabytes. So I'm not going to explain that. I think we know that. Velocity, what is velocity? Anybody knows what is velocity here? Okay, so velocity is when you're getting a lot of data quickly, you know, like the transactions on eBay, or, um, you know, when you have a lot of Facebook likes for a mass campaign. So, so that is velocity. In, in very little time, you have a lot of data which is coming in. And then what is variety? Variety is different formats of data. Uh, veracity is uh, veracity, value, and visualization. These are properties that were added to big data. Why? Because value is what business wants from big data. But veracity, what is veracity? And this is actually a gray area. So I will probably take like 30 seconds to talk about this. Veracity is the ability to actually verify that this is the truth. Now, you know, if, if I showed you uh, like one billion rows, one billion, B for boy, okay, one billion. If I was to show you one billion rows of data and if I was to ask you, hey, do you uh, see a particular student who has passed this test, right? Would you be able to tell, I mean, and if you tell me, would I be able to find out ever, do you think? I can find out ever? So I would have to depend on a tool, right? So this is what this is about. How do I know what big data is telling me is the truth? Because you can tell me, hey, you failed. And if I trust you, or if I don't have an option to verify this, I'm going to say, OK, you know, so this student has failed. So this is very important, and that's why I put it here. Because all of us must know that whatever big data projects you do, it's like taking a blind shot unless you verify it. You know, unless you can really say, this is what is in this big data. Then we talk about visualization. So human beings, we have our own uh, you know, limitations. If I was to put like 10 screens of um, you know, data here, just, just 10 screens of Excel data, and if I was to say, hey, which city is not listed in this data, do you think you would be, remember from, you would be able to remember from one screen to another? It, it's a very tough call, right? So what we have to do in big data is we have to make this very easy to visualize. You know, so, so we choose different ways of visualizing data. So that's why these are three critical extensions. And then there is variability, volatility, and vulnerability. So what is variability? It is the variations in data. You know, sometimes you get some data, sometimes you don't. Volatility is how quickly your data is outdated. For example, you know, uh, you had this case with the Salman Khan, and you know, I mean, we all know this, right? So uh, this volatility thing is, is, is something really interesting because this happens in Indian media. You know, it is my popular topic today. So all of the media is talking about it today, right? But if you want to tra track the same talk topic next day, can you really find news about the topic next day? So if, if you're a big data researcher, you know, so there's a lot of volatility of data. I mean, it is there today, but it may not be there tomorrow. I mean, Salman Khan's case is settled, you know, so maybe something happened, we don't know. And then, you know, so there's, there's no more news about it, right? And then there's vulnerability. So, which again uh, points to, you know, a previous issue about making mistakes from data. This is the new business environment. Now, in B schools, you know, there's, there is a framework which we use, which is called PESTEL, you know, political. So, so businesses, they operate in a very big environment. You know, this environment is defined in terms of political, economic, social, technological, environmental, you know, ecological, uh, legal governance, and how globalized your economy is, uh, you know, who's your customer, and what is your competition. So this is where big data is coming in now. Big data is capturing all of this environment now. It has to capture this environment so that your business can get a complete picture. Um, and it's not an easy job, but I just wanted to make sure we all know this.
Um, and this is what the clouds foretell, you know, like the rain. So big data is leading us to artificial intelligence, which will ultimately, you know, is, is actually already there. Uh, I mean, we don't see a lot of it here, but we are already there. Uh, it's robotics, it's already there, it's happening. And I, I could not resist, resist sharing this idea about big data. How many of us have actually seen those kind of files here? Uh, can, you, can anybody uh, tell me you've seen those kind of files on the left? Yeah, we have, right? So we, when we started, <laughs> thank you, thank you. When we, when, we, when we were trying to computerize, right, what was the idea? The idea was we would get rid of that, right? And it would be easy to find the information. And now we have this big data model, right? And we have this rags. So those files have now been replaced by files, electronic files, in these racks which are on the right hand side. Okay? And the challenge is still the same. How do you find the information that you need at the right time? So, you know, so I could not resist sharing this graphic because we have not solved the problem, if you ask me. So, so amongst all this, what is the subject knowledge that one needs, um, you know, to master this art of analytics? Um, so, the analytics domain, it lies at the intersection of the three circles. One is business expertise. You must know what is your business and what you're doing with it. Uh, the other is, um, you know, the ITPs. And the third less known part, I think so, is the, is the statistical piece, the probabilities and a lot of algorithms that come from it. So that is why, um, you know, if you actually have a data scientist, and please don't look at me, I am... I'm a wannabe data scientist. You know, I have done my courses, I've done my education, I have had a long work history, but I am still, um, you know, I, I still call myself a learner because this is an ocean, and you will shortly uh, see why I call this an ocean. Um, so if you're looking at a data scientist, you're actually looking at three persons in one, traditionally, and that is why it is so difficult to find. So I want all of you to be excited about being a data scientist. But please understand there's a big challenge. You have to do three, th three roles in one, which is you have to know the coding, the IT, the infrastructure, everything, the business expertise, and you also need the statistical knowledge. Now, there, there can be a little bit of give and take between these areas. Um, you know, depending on your business situation, you may be able to offset a little bit, but ultimately this is what it is. This is the big picture. So this is a typical big data architecture. You know, this is basically from Hadoop. Uh, there is a management framework. And why do we have a management framework? Because you have distributed computing. You have clusters and nodes and a lot of hardware. The, the kind of picture that I showed you about the racks. Um, you have a development framework through which the developers develop you know, their uh, solutions. A distributed processing framework because you have to ensure data travels between nodes and architecture. Distributed storage, because what if, um, you know, one node fails, so we call that redundancy. So there is a redundancy in all nodes. Even if one node goes down, uh, you know, I should have another node which can come up quickly, real time. And that is why, um, you know, when you do Google queries, seldom do you ever get an error. Have, have you ever wondered, I mean, you know, we do Google queries. Uh, when you go to a typical website, it may be any organization, it may be Tata or it may be Forbes or it may be WallStreetJournal.com or something like that. Sometimes you get an error, right? Uh, the page failed to load, this is something, something. How many of us have actually seen a Google error? We haven't. Most of us haven't. We, we can't recall that, right? So I found this to be a very interesting example of redundancy because Google has created that kind of architecture where redundancy is so high that most of us, we don't recollect ever. I mean, we don't really remember if there's a Google failure, yeah? I mean, of course, you know, there is no prediction to it. I mean, it can happen, you know, just the next, next moment after I get off from this dice, and then you can catch me and say, hey, you told me it never fails, right? No, it, it can. This is hardware, okay? But this is what their architect, this is what the beauty of this system is. It, it does not fail right now. Um, and it is replaced quickly, real time. And then there is an integration framework because of the components. And then there is business intelligence and reporting. So these are, this is a little more detail about the components. Um, you know, I've listed these components. Uh, if, if somebody has questions, you know, we can 
get into more detail about these separately. But I just wanted to show you that you know these are some of the components. This is the Hadoop thing you know that you heard about. You know this is the elephant in the room. We know right Hadoop is uh, you know the, the name came from a toy elephant, right? So okay. Um, so so what does the analytics pie offer you know to uh, business people? It offers a lot of you know a variety of functions. Um, we have competition analysis. You know, basically, you can analyze your competition and find out who's doing what. Is it important? I mean, do you think in today's date, is this competition analysis important? Any anybody feels who cares? I mean, let them do what they're doing. I have my space. I'll do. I'll keep doing what I'm doing. No, I mean, the reality is, you know, we are in a very connected world today. So it's no more. You know, I'm happy with my life. I don't care what you do. I mean, yes, personally, yes, you know, it's fine. But uh, when it comes to business, you really have to watch out. What is your competition doing and how are they doing it? And are you underserving or over-serving or just right-serving your customer? Um, and which comes, you know, which brings us to the next point, which is customer analytics. So are people happy or unhappy? And we, we've, I think, heard a lot about this. So I will just quickly skip past. Um, Post-sales support analytics, uh, new product development, is there is there analytics to it? Yes, there is because you. you I mean, the, the closest example you can think of is the App Store. Most of us have a smartphone, yeah, and we have we know what's an App Store, what's a Play Store. So a lot of times you you see a new app there, you know, and they they ask you what was your experience and how was it because they try to understand is it the time they can you know ask you to pay a dollar or is it not the time yet? So new product analytics, then crowdfunding. A lot of people, you know, uh, are nowadays trying to get together across cities, cultures, you know, and maybe even planets in the future, you know, maybe, maybe we'll have somebody from Mars, you know, I mean, if we colonize Mars ultimately, right? So, um, a lot of things happening in recruitment space, JD, uh, you know, job description, skill matching, and HR analytics. A lot of stuff happening there because it is important. It's a, it's a very important function for the organization. Uh, media and messaging, this we know because we all probably are on Facebook and WhatsApp, so we know. Uh, and we also know about Cambridge Analytica and stuff like that. Yeah? So, so we, we understand how important it is. Uh, is 50 million a big number compared to the world population? No, but it could actually have changed the outcome of the US election. So that is the allegation you know, which has led into all this uh, series of analysis and stuff like that. Then word of mouth analytics. Now, what is word of mouth? You know, so I, I want to take 30 seconds on this. Word of mouth is actually somebody talking about your product. We know what is word of mouth, but there's, there is a lot of word of mouth analytics, uh, you know, which actually is termed as something else or something else. But eventually it has become very important nowadays to understand what are people talking about, you know, in, when they talk about your product or your organization or your CEO, you know. I mean, there are people, there, there are CEOs who are, you know, who make a controversial statement, right? Uh, and then, you know, they have to be really let, they have to let go, you know. So, um, process analytics, uh, this is the heart of manufacturing organizations especially, but also in retail distribution, you know, wherever you have a lot of processes happening. And normally, I mean, uh, a lot of organizations have very complex processes. Warehousing and transportation is the old magic uh, where you know all this thing began about management we know right uh, that this logistics the term logistics it actually came from the u.s military and the you know and the um, the management this uh, education called management it actually comes from logistics and uh, that um, the arrangements the u.s military had to make for the world wars so this is you know so this has been at the core because they understand um, and if uh, some of us have been to the u.s you really understand why transportation and logistics is important because it's a vast country. You know, we don't realize this because we see people. You know, uh, we we keep looking, we keep seeing people, we keep meeting people, and if we need help, you, we are lucky. You know, we find people within India. Um, you know, sometimes I mean, yes, you do have a bad experience, but we're kind of lucky. But in the U.S., with the almost one fourth of the population and three times, three and a half times India's geography and a huge span, you know, it's, it's a wide and deep country. So finding people uh, to help and, uh, you know, working with transportation and warehousing is terrible. It, it is a huge challenge. Uh, 
Um, then quality analytics, you know, we all know about Six Sigma and ISO. So it actually kind of started with ISO, but you know, the ISO movement has its own thing. Um, reworks and costs, these an analytics are very important. Then intelligent backups when it comes to your, uh, you know, software and documents. In fact, I worked for an organization, the world's largest organization that does backups for people, you know, whether you have documents or micro tapes or, you know, those pie capsules, I've seen them all. Um, intelligent routing, waste management. How big is waste management? Anybody has an idea? How big is India's waste management industry? It's almost a trillion dollars. It's very big. It's very, very big. We waste a lot. First of all, you know, as, as a country, we have a lot of wastage. And then secondly, you know, the, uh, the estimates are very high. Um, energy management is again huge. Why? Because energy costs are rising and we know what are fossil fuels and this and that and carbon credits, right? Um, so we want to optimize our resources. So this is, these are some very important functions that are being addressed by analytics uh, researchers and, you know, practitioners. Uh, who are some of the more visible leaders? Obviously, Google, Amazon. I, you know, we talked about the retail apocalypse that Amazon is causing to others. Uh, Apple, silently but always there, in a nice way, uh, gentlemanly or gentle, you know, nice womanly conduct, whatever. Um, AT&T and telecoms, because you know a lot of data passes through, and they also offer uh, Wi-Fi and internet and stuff like that. Walmart, yes. Um, the governments of the first world are very, very concerned and they are all investing into um, analytics big time. Uh, the UK and Japan have started what is called, uh, started a national center for text mining jointly in London. Uh, this was about 2013. Um, and you know, they are taking it very seriously as, as two countries for security and a lot of integration. Um, and then we have security agencies, militaries, Sports and celebrities, of course, you know, they have to. It's about brand management and their own image management. And then pharma and scientific research, you know, understanding what is the impact of uh, medicine or certain behaviors on people's, uh, you know, diseases and lifestyle issues and stuff like that. So what are the key concerns for analytics adoption in India? This is something I, I looked at, you know, I mean, why uh, we don't, we are not really seeing a lot of application uh, here. I mean, we're beginning to, but I mean, we're not that big a market yet. So there are concerns about the complexity of big data because the, I mean, we need to learn more. Um, there is a rather unclear picture about technology stack and also, um, you know, does it strike you sometimes? I mean, I'm sure it does. Uh, I think I would correct that. I think it strikes all of us uh, that, you know, you have only four metros in India and how, what is the population of India, right? So, I mean, is it is it okay to have just four centers of, of growth in the country? I mean, you know, so we have to question some very basic, um, you know, um, issues in the economy. Why? Because we don't have access to people, you know. Um, the small scale, and I will, I will talk about it, and uh, part of my presentation I have focused on the small and medium enterprise. Uh, the pains is that, you know, there are industries in Agra, there are industries in Muradabad, you know, uh, there's, there are industries in Jagadri, you know, which is a plywood city. Uh, anyone has heard about Ambala, a city called Ambala? You know, this was a pioneer in instrumentation, you know, uh, they create all the scientific instruments in India, they literally come from this place. So I have, I have looked at a lot of small and medium industry clusters. And it is interesting, um, um, you know, if you can find even like 10 IT engineers in Ambala, would you believe that? Yeah? Because there are no jobs for them, you know, there is no sustaining ecosystem for them. So this is a huge pain point. I mean, even if these people want to evolve, is somebody from Bombay going to, I mean, who would ever like to travel to uh, Muradabad and Ambala and those places? Who wants to go there? Anybody here? No, right? So, see, this is, this is the thing. So, we don't have the ecosystem for a lot of industry which is outside all these, uh, you know, four met metropolis, right? Uh, and then, Unfortunately, you know, there's a lack of data culture, which is, you know, given to historical reasons and hierarchies that we have within the organizations. So we need to bring in a more data-driven culture, you know, because otherwise what's the point of, you know, doing analytics? I mean, if ultimately boss is right, 
right? Your boss says, no, this is my decision. I told you this, this product goes, this, you put it on the back burner. We're not going to, you know, go with this new product. Just go with this one. I told you. If that is how it's going to work, then what's the point of doing analytics, right? So a lot of people feel frustrated. I talk to people and they say, oh, no, boss is always right. And, you know, we... So, so we have to get into this data-driven culture. Also at the country level, you know, I think we have to expect and demand data-driven decision-making and culture, yeah? Uh, and then there's a higher investment in ROI, um, you know, issue. Why, why is there a higher investment? Can anybody tell me? Why do you think big data uh, requires high investments? Has anybody heard about, like, commodity hardware, something like that in context of big data? So let, let me give you, a, you know, a glimpse into that. Uh, when big data came out, uh, they said this will use commodity hardware. Now, in, in normal English, you know, if, if I translate into straightforward Hindi or Marathi, Gujarati, whatever, you know, so this means very cheap hardware. Commodity, alu, piaz, you know, it's like that is what we correlate it with. This is a commodity. But their commodity in the U.S., you know, is not our commodity. That was the problem, you know. So the commodity hardware they are talking about, it starts with 32 GB RAM. How many of us have a laptop with 16 GB RAM here or a workstation? I would doubt, okay? So this is, see, this is the problem. And then you have this dollar to currency thing, you know, so uh, the, uh, the rupee thing, you know, so anything you want to bring in, for example, I try to import a machine from the US, you know, and it, it costs me one and a half lakhs. Now, one and a half lakhs is not a big amount, but when you're a researcher, a student, now, you know, you have the context, why it matters. So if, if, if our students, our researchers are not even able to get those kind of machines, so how do you get this analytics thing happening in India, right? So there are, there are those kind of issues um, at the country level. Whereas um, a class seven child in the US typically is, you know, nowadays working on those kind of laptops that have those kind of capabilities. So these are issues, you know, we have to resolve them at the country level. But we also have to raise them, you know, somewhere. Um, and then, therefore, you know, we have limited use cases. Um, but I said, you know, this, this doesn't help much because we don't know then, you know, I mean, I can't just pull it off and say, okay, we don't have much in India, so bye bye audience, I don't have anything for you. You know, so I looked into research by McKinsey and, you know, some other organizations, a number of organizations, and, uh, you know, I said, well, let's, let's hear from people who've actually done it. So the biggest challenge, uh, you know, apart from the hardware and the, the, the country-specific issues we have, the biggest challenge actually is the learning culture. How do you go from a knowing culture to a learning culture? Because, you know, uh, people have this tendency. You go to them and you say, hey, I want to do this survey. I want to find out how's my uh, juice uh, B doing compared to juice A, right? And there's always this person who's been in the market for 40 years, right? Who started as a sales boy and then rose the ranks and said, oh, don't worry, I know what to do. Uh, hey, hey, no, 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 we, we really want to do this exercise. No, 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 you don't need to do it. Don't waste your dollar, you know, don't waste your money. I know what to do, I'll tell you. Okay, so, you know, so, so that's the end of the story. So we have to move away from this culture, you know, and, and this, this, this is even coming from American organizations because this is, this is a study of America. Even they are facing this issue. So why am I talking about this here? Because I want us all to have this solace, you know. I, I want all of us to feel happy that they also have the same problem, <laughs> you know. So, so we are not unique in some of the issues. And this, is, this is a common issue. And moving away from this culture is very important. How do you become more objective and data-driven? Like I said about India, you know, so I found this, this is, a, this is an issue there also. Uh, CEOs and CIOs are talking about it. So then we are not unique, you know, so it's not a problem that we can't solve. If they are living with it and they are moving ahead with it, so can we also do it? So, you know, I want to bring hope to all of us. Um, the power of fear, you know, there is, there is a lot of power to fear. Uh, because how do you think differently? You know, if, if I ask somebody here, hey, can you please think differently? What does it mean, right? How do you know what is different, right? So it's, it's a big challenge, you know, and uh, as I was growing up in my professional life, once in a while, you know, my boss said, you have to think different. And I seriously, I looked up, you know, in the mirror to myself and I said, what is different, you know? What, what different, you know? I mean, how do you define this? So I had to rack my brains, I had to do everything. And sometimes I succeeded, sometimes I didn't succeed. 
but the power of fear you know of thinking different in this age of big data right so this is this is a fear we have to overcome and they they have these two you know so i i want to stress that again and again that we're not unique in this um the mindset change like i said you know the expert based to the more learning oriented so in the big data era i can promise you one thing if anybody here dares to become a data scientist dares is the word right so you will have to keep learning there is going to be no end to learning i promise you that because it's a very rapidly evolving ecosystem very very rapidly evolving you read about something today and tomorrow morning they have found out something else okay so this is this is one thing you have to remember we have to change our attitudes i know this from i know this to i'm going to look at this i'm going to find out more i'm going to learn more what is good for me today and then what is the right set of tools uh, remember i i showed a, a couple of slides about the ecosystem so there is so many things there and you know you haven't actually even looked at all of the uh, the entire ecosystem so what is the right set of tools for my enterprise who is going to answer this question do you think somebody from outside can answer this question you know the business right so remember the three circles there is one business expertise there is one technology there is one statistical component to it so who is going to tell us what is good for me who tells me what what food is good for me right so it's 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 boils down to as simple an example is that because when you are the ceo you can't look really outside all you can do is you can go out and gather information but it's your call ultimately um and then because this space is relatively new there are individual wins we hear about some success stories but remember there is no um, you know there is no encompassing ecosystem to look up to as at least as of now uh, and this is a challenge in the us too you know so like i said we are we are same you know in, in that manner too uh, data privacy uh, yes they take it more seriously uh, but i think it's time we also take care of these issues here in india before we get into bigger issues yeah so customers it has been found and you know this this is coming from uh, i believe from the atnt the ceo of atnt so what they have found is that customers are willing to give some information you know they are willing to share and trade a little bit of information provided you give them some benefit so they're talking about making customers partners in the privacy pact you know that okay if you provide me all this information i will hopefully be able to provide you personalized service for your mobile phone you know or for your internet access or for your tv excuse me for your tv programming because in the us you know they've already moved to uh, internet uh, tv and on so so customers are willing i mean this is a little ahead of time maybe for india uh, because we we are not there yet but i think the problem is the same you know here also people don't really want to give you a lot of information there is awareness is happening so please try to make them partners in your business you know assure them that you will protect it and use the information responsibly um and then within the organization a lot of roles have to be redefined um you know a lot of uh, the organization charter itself for example this was one ceo talking about his organization uh, for to mckinsey and i found it very interesting so they worked through the entire organization setup again to redefine the entire organization how it will become more internet savvy you know how it will respond to its business environment we talked about earlier um and then you know enabling a lot, uh, creating a, a very enabling environment you know through training and forums and so on and so forth yeah okay so i'll i'll quickly uh, take you through a set of findings on um, smes so in india smes are about 6% of gdp uh, they employ about 80.5 million people contribute 33% to manufacturing and to 45% of india's exports so this is a very important sector and that is why you know the next two three slides and then we will actually ramp uh, close down um even so i compared this situation to the us you know i said okay is the us like that too and interestingly i found that the us bureau of uh, employment and you know industry it says that more than 99% of us firms are actually small and medium businesses more than 99% because you have fortune 500 which we all know about 
but imagine the rest, right? So the entire minus Fortune 500, and then you have a couple. Um, within those, 98% people, which is almost the entire sample, agrees the technology is very important, and they use as many as five to 12 devices. So small business owners in the US, because they don't have cheap labor, so they are using a lot of devices themselves. So, so that is the learning thing they have done. You know, so this is a good thing. We can do it too here, right? So, and then uh, they know what is cloud, and they 51% uh, um, of the owners uh, are transitioning to cloud-based technologies. Um, in the UK, you know, so I wanted to see what is happening in the UK. Uh, in the UK, the government has already moved moved to promising more than half at least half or maybe more than half of all IT spending to small SMEs. So they would want to break down the, the biggies, you know, the dominant players. And they are encouraging even large players, Fortune 500s, they're, they're asking them to hire SMEs to work with them, you know. So because SMEs is, is, the, is the lifeline for uh, even that country. So. In India, there is about 137 million people online as of now. Uh, it may have gone up. I mean, this is the number I took. Um, and we have the second largest uh, population on Facebook in the world, uh, which may actually have become number one by now, because this is a little dated data. Um, so what does this have for SMEs? Well, these are forums that you can use. You know, So um, I want to talk a bit about how vendors can uh, target SMEs small and medium businesses, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the biggest challenge for SMEs is to develop customizable software. This is, you know, these are all findings from different studies that I've conducted and surveys and stuff like that. And also, you know, reports from others. Um, there has to be a subscription-based pricing because SMEs cannot put a lot of money up front. Um, and to benefit, a cloud-based platform is highly recommended. Um, there is a need to develop a kind of training for SMBs, you know, and to, to help them develop a rich understanding of technology so that they can decide where to go, you know, so we should become enablers of their decisions. Um, help them self-service, you know, so create tools which help in self-service. Uh, develop healthy multi-data ecosystems. One big part missing in India is, you know, a lot of data. We, we don't have access to data. And even SMEs don't have access to a lot of data. Um, so there is a need to develop multi-data ecosystems with all privacy and stuff in place. And also provide do-it-yourself analytics and forecasting. Um, this is a case, uh, you know, a, a very little case. I found this uh, in uh, the Economic Times. Ritu Kumar is a label. Some of you might have heard about this label. This is a fashion label. So, you know, they have recently um, decided to uh, hire an agency. I wouldn't like to share the name here because, you know, I'm not advertising for somebody. But I think the knowledge, this knowledge is sufficient that even, you know, small private labels, I mean, this is not a very big uh, label, but it, it's a famous label. Uh, but if you look at their volumes and stuff, they're they are considerable, but, you know, they're not huge. They are huge, they are big, okay. But you know, we may be differing in scale. So I, I accept, you know, that part, yeah. Uh, but it, it's a good example to share, uh, and there are many more actually um, happening. So uh, with this, I would like to close my presentation here. Um, I think one glorified, um, you know, um, learning that has been given to us is that success you know is is very shiny is 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 awesome it looks great but uh, you know i found this from scott uh, you know so i've attributed it to him and i uh, in fact i i kind of very closely agree with this i think success is a soiled you know ugly looking child because it it has to toil it has to work very hard you know and we forget that part so you know so so so, so like that you know invention or real creation, um, innovation, you know, which we want to see here, it is a very tough process. It is a very sloppy process. Um, there are a lot of failures. There is no uncertainty. There are very dark days in life, in lives of innovators. 
Um, and the end result, you know, when we get to see some success, looks very bright. But for every innovation, every single innovation, we know thousands of people die unsung. So, so the point is that, you know, we should remember this. And if we are working hard, if we have tough times, I think we should realize we are on some path. So with that, I would like to close the session. Thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, um, I could probably take a few questions. Yes, please. Uh. Good afternoon. Hello. Yes, please. Uh, I heard a speech from Mukesh Ambani two to three months back. In that speech, what he what he mentioned was that uh, data is replacing oil. Data is the new oil. That's what I also. Data yeah. is the new oil. Yes. Yeah. So, what is your stand on it? Like, if uh, like 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 we have wars for uh, oil today, so is there is there any possibility that that will be having wars for data also? That's my question to you. Could you could you say uh, that again? I missed a little bit of it. Data uh, is the new oil. Um, data is the new Mukesh oil. Mukesh said that, like, yes. Like the whole world is fighting for oil today. Right. So is there any possibility that that will be having uh, wars for data also? That is my question. I think it's, it's a very interesting thought, first of all. Um, well, there are kind of wars happening, you know, but I mean, they're not the wars that we think that are being fought with weapons, but these are being fought in courts, like the Cambridge Analytica case. So to your point, yes, um, you know, there is going to be a struggle about data and there are, uh, you know, concerns which will increase because, uh, you know, we, we see that there are in, inadvertent cases, you know, where violations will happen. So those, um, you know, wars, if I may say, in the legal rooms or the battles, you know, um, I think they will happen. Yeah. Yeah. Sir. I just, because he had prayers in time, so I'll just take his question. You can say that this will be the last question. Yes, Sir, please. Yes, uh, you mentioned that the um, data analytics and big data for SMEs, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and you showed how it could be used. Yes. Like Ritu Kumar label. Right. Um, for an SME, how does one budget for something like this and to progress forward and apply the advantages of the uh, big data in the business? Sure. Because I, I can see it already that it would be a tremendous advantage definitely. for my business. Definitely, definitely. Um, if if uh, we don't mind, I will also put a slide here because, you know, I had uh, kept it as a reserve just in case, you know, I needed it. Um, this is a slide. This is from the Netherlands. And it kind of, you know, it helps me answer the question. So um, how do SMEs actually make use of big data? Um, they, uh, they, they do have a valid concern, first of all, you know, uh, which is the big investment and the access to resources, and then also trying to maintain the infrastructure. So these are very valid concerns. And uh, yet, there is a big value proposition for them. Otherwise, you know, it's a question of survival also for them. So uh, what I, I studied an ecosystem in, in the Netherlands, and uh, that is why I put up this slide. So there, uh, there, there is an organization and a platform. Uh, they, what they have done is they have already signed up with uh, a number of SMEs. So they have pooled their requirements, you know, the, the broad high level needs together uh, because the biggest challenge is in customizing for one SME and then, you know, trying to move on and trying to sell to another SME. So I found this case very interesting. Uh, what they did was they studied a cluster of SMEs. They carved out the unique needs, uh, you know, separately and the common needs and they have created a SSAAS, Software as a Service Platform. Um, and they host the hardware, and this is a per pay model. So, um, you know, so the reason I've, I brought these examples um, here is because I want our audience to know that these things are challenges even in other places, but they are resolving uh, these issues in this manner. So maybe, you know, uh, this is an opportunity. Actually, this question is an opportunity for somebody in India to create that kind of a offering. Uh, and then, you know, this can be done better. Let's let's take it offline. You can. He's here with us. 
he has another session on ai and chatbot so maybe okay okay no just just one more so so something like say a trade association can get together absolutely and and, and, and create a platform which can be obviously confidential to, from each other but uh, something like that yes 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 you know so so if if there is an identification of common needs in you know in a particular uh, group or a cluster so uh, there is a possibility and you know so this this work actually shows that it, it it's actually working they've already signed up uh, 25 smes and they are supported by a lot of data researchers also but are, are that those smes are they in the same business uh, in the same sector or in different sectors some of them are in different uh, in in a, in a different sector but this platform was built basically for smes whether they come from you know uh, one sector or another sector because what they did was for example every sme has accounting needs you know every sme has say tax needs and some other needs so they have at this moment they have taken those common needs at a higher level and then they are trying to build it further so i think it's a very interesting approach and uh, to your question yeah thank you